Welcome back, everyone. Um, so we are starting a class on New Testament survey. Um, would someone please open us in prayer before we begin? Let's pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, O oh Lord. We pray as we resume back to this New Testament survey that you will speak to us through the lessons. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so I had posted on Google Classroom, has everyone seen and prepared to share on your chapter on Luke online? In person, I yeah, I'm not sure everyone's on Google Classroom, right? All, all of you, yeah. Uh, Sister Gertrude, yes, you can go ahead. Sister, I did uh, chapter 20 on Luke. Okay, okay. Um, yes, the <laughs> chapter Luke is continuation of uh, chapter. Uh, uh, Luke 20 is continuation of Luke uh, 19, where Jesus had, uh, uh, you know, got rid of all those who were buying and selling in the temple and says, this is the house of my prayer, prayer oh. house. And the okay. priest uh, and... The sorry. Uh, you don't have to share right now. Uh, sorry, uh, you can. We what we'll do is we'll go from the beginning of Luke. I think we may not get to Luke chapter twenty today. Uh, we'll oh, we'll okay. see how much we can cover, and then uh, whatever we are not able to cover today, we'll continue into uh, on Thursday. Okay, sister. No problem. Thank you. So uh, what we'll do is we'll just finish covering the background of Luke now, and then we'll start uh, going through the book of Luke itself. Uh, so I haven't put the outline on the presentation since each of you will be sharing. We can just have our Bibles open uh, and be ready to share one after the other based on whichever chapter has been assigned to you. Okay, and if you didn't uh, get any chapter in Luke, the next book that we are looking at, we'll assign chapters from uh, John to the rest of the class. Okay, uh, we'll see how today goes also. Okay, so let's just continue. We won't do a recap in this class because there's a lot of content we need to cover, so we can't go back to last week's content. Uh, we'll just continue from where we stopped last week. Uh, so Luke, uh, we were looking at some of the things that the uh, Gospel of Luke emphasizes compared to the other Gospels. Uh, one of the things that Luke also focuses on is the journeys that Jesus makes uh, as he's ministering. So uh, we see in Luke 8.1, Jesus went from Nazareth to every town and village of Galilee. So Galilee is up here on the map. Uh, you can see Nazareth there. Uh, so Jesus uh, ministered a lot in Galilee during uh, in, in what Luke has recorded um, about Jesus's ministry. Then uh, 951 to 1941 is Jesus's journey from Galilee uh, so down to Jerusalem, okay, and then uh, 23, chapter 23 is where uh, he goes from the Judgment Hall to Calvary, then uh, 24 we see the journey to Emmaus, so Jerusalem to Emmaus is there, uh, you travel a bit west, and then uh, Jesus' heavenward journey. Um, so one of the thoughts is that because Jesus ministered so much in Galilee, uh, in Acts 1.8, when he's sending out the disciples, he says uh, he sends them to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. He doesn't mention Galilee specifically, uh, although I'm sure they did go there and did minister there. So what's also... Uh, 
amazing is that Jesus' heart for Samaria still doesn't change. Like we talked about, um, I think we talked about it in our other class in interpreting scripture. We talked about the background of Samaria, right? The uh, Jews um, kind of disowned the people of Samaria, not recognizing them as in any way related to the Jews. They uh, viewed them as people who were apostate, who had rejected the true God and the true faith. But uh, Jesus was very much concerned about the Sumerians in his ministry. And also, as he sends them out, uh, sends the disciples out, he mentioned Samaria specifically. So uh, although the Jews had didn't have that heart for the Sumerians, uh, Jesus, Samaritans, Jesus definitely still um, viewed them as people that he wanted to reach and restore uh, to faith in him. So uh, we also see in Luke, there's a, a lot of contrast between different groups of people, uh, between the rich and the poor, especially. We talked about this in other examples. Uh, between Jesus and John the Baptist, uh, between Mary and Martha, the Pharisee and the tax collector, this is in the parable uh, of them praying, the rich man and Lazarus, another parable, uh, between Peter and Judas, and between the thieves on either side of the cross. So Luke, uh, while he's, we talked about the fact that he focuses a lot on people uh, in his gospel, uh, he's also bringing out certain characteristics of people and contrasting them with uh, other groups of people. So uh, how people respond to Jesus. Luke also emphasizes prayer. So we see a list of different places in which uh, Jesus prays at his baptism, after uh, the day of miracles, uh, maybe we can just open that Luke 5, 15 and 16. Someone can read that for us, please. Yes, sister, I'll read. Uh, Luke 5, 15 and 16. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Thank you. Um, and then we see uh, other records. So before he uh, chose the 12 disciples, before he first predicted uh, about his suffering, uh, before teaching the Lord's Prayer uh, to his disciples at his transfiguration, and he prays for Peter um, before Peter is, um, Peter denies Jesus. Jesus says, I've prayed for you because Satan uh, is going to test you and the other disciples uh, in Gethsemane and then on the cross itself. Uh, so lots of examples of Jesus praying in Luke. Um, there are two parables also on prayer. Uh, the friend at midnight. So this is the friend who knocks on the door of his uh, friend and asks for bread because he has visitors. Um, and then Jesus says, uh, even if your friend doesn't give you the bread because you're his friend, the reason he'll give it because you are audacious enough to go in the middle of the night to ask for bread. So this is how we should pray. We should uh, persist in our prayer and we should not be afraid to ask of certain things uh, when we need it. Right. Uh, so that is one parable on prayer. Uh, the other is the unrighteous judge. So the widow who keeps going back to a judge for justice and the judge, although he may not care about justice, uh, gives in to her because of her persistence. And Jesus says, this is how we should pray as well. Um, the Pharisee and the publican. So this is the, uh, where the Pharisee and the tax collector are praying in the temple uh, and how God responds to their prayers. Um, 
emphasis on the Holy Spirit. So we see a lot of mention of the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of Luke, uh, which is also a little bit, uh, we don't see that as much in the other Gospels where the Holy Spirit is being mentioned. This may be because from here, Luke also goes into the Book of Acts, uh, talking much more about the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we see the Holy Spirit mentioned at Jesus' conception, uh, when Zacharias is... Uh, um, Zacharias, I think, responds. Let's just open that Luke one sixty seven. Luke chapter one sixty seven. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Thank you. So this is after John the Baptist is born. Um, after Zechariah is able to speak again, uh, he prophesies here. Uh, then we have Simeon, who is mentioned, who uh, sees Jesus at the temple and prophesies. Uh, we have John the Baptist. Uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus at his baptism, Jesus at tem his temptation, uh, Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, uh, then Jesus in his prayer, and then the disciples are instructed to wait for the Holy Spirit. So uh, lots of mentions of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's also an emphasis on joy. Uh, so in the beginning and end of the Gospel, uh, we see where uh, Jesus' birth is prophesied about. Uh, let's read these, one fourteen and 47, Luke chapter 1, verses 14 and 47, and then Luke 24, we'll also read from there. Joy and delight to you. I knew the worst because of his fault. Next one, Pastor. Um, sorry, um, we were not able to hear very clearly. I'm not sure if you read Luke. Did you read the first verse or Luke for or Luke one fourteen? Luke one fourteen. Yeah, you can go ahead. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his faith. Thank you, and you can read uh, verse forty seven as well. My song. Glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Thank you. And Luke twenty four fifty two and fifty three. Luke twenty four fifty two fifty three, and they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually in the temple blessing God. Thank you. So we see right at the start of the gospel, uh, Jesus' birth being prophesied about and uh, the joy that is uh, spoken about at Jesus' birth. And then Luke 24, the disciples' joy after Jesus' uh, resurrection and ascension. Um, then we see parables about rejoicing over the lost being found. So chapter 15 has uh, various uh, parables on uh, the lost being found, the lost coin, the prodigal son, the lost sheep. Uh, so each of these parables, uh, there is rejoicing in heaven over the lost being found. And then the story of Zacchaeus as well, uh, where... Uh, Luke 19, 6. I'll just read that for us. 
so Zacchaeus came down from the tree and welcomed uh, Jesus gladly. Uh, so stories about how Jesus brings joy to people. Um, then we look at the author of the book of Luke. Now we know uh, that uh, Luke traveled with uh, the Apostle Paul. Okay, so uh, Luke in Colossians 4.14 is said to be a physician or a doctor um, and probably also a Gentile uh, based on that same verse. So if he is a Gentile, then uh, he's the only Gentile who actually wrote in the New Testament. Uh, everyone else is a Jew uh, or to write any part of scripture, in fact. Uh, Luke was interested. So uh, some people uh, say that it is in his interest in medical matters that he records certain things in the Bible uh, about uh, Simon's mother-in-law having a fever, about another person who's healed, and about their sickness, he describes it. Um, and Luke was also very attentive to detail, so he gives a lot of historical detail uh, when he's recording stories about who was in power, who, what was the political situation at that time. Um, Luke, we know, traveled with Paul, so we see records about that uh, in Paul's letters. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.11, maybe we can just read these two verses. 2 Timothy 4.11 and Philemon 1.24. Second Timothy 4.11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Thank you. And Philemon 124. Philemon 124. As do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. Okay, so uh, we see here Luke uh, walking or traveling with Paul on his missionary journey. So, uh, like we talked about with uh, the book of Mark being Peter's um, recollection of Jesus' ministry, uh, Luke uh, would be highly influenced by Paul uh, in his writing. Uh, so, as a physician, uh, Luke would have been well educated. So, we see that in his writing, uh, the Greek that's used is uh, one of the best uses of Greek in the New Testament. So, Luke and the book of Hebrews, uh, Luke, Acts, and Hebrews are supposed to be very uh, literate Greek compared to the rest of New the New Testament. Um, and also, Luke and Acts together are uh, the longer than all of Paul's letters written uh, together, all of the epistles together. So Luke has contributed a lot to the New Testament. Uh, so who was he writing to? Uh, we see in Luke 1.3 uh, that Luke is addressing somebody named Theophilus. So um, I'll just read that. He says, um, Okay, that's in the middle of the verse. So he says, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most most excellent Theophilus. Um, so while he may have been writing to somebody named Theophilus, he was not writing just a private work. The size of this letter, Luke and Acts, uh, was written on a standard scroll size. So it would have been written so that it could be published and sent out to other people. So he's writing, uh, when the writers were writing, they would take into account how much space do we have uh, to write, because it was not very, um, uh, in terms of monetary investment, it was quite expensive to write on these scrolls. So Luke has written on a full scroll that would be uh, the size of something that would be published or would be sent out to other people. 
Uh, so when he's using most excellent, that would refer to someone who is of a higher status, usually a Roman officer. And uh, he may be also addressing a larger group of people who are associated with Theophilus. So he's writing to uh, people of a higher status, uh, people in authority. Uh, but he's also writing to the church at large, um, specifically uh, to uh, to Gentiles, not specific, uh, not uh, to Jews. Then we see here uh, the date of writing. So there are again with all of the Gospels, there are different views on when the Gospel was written. Uh, Seventy to ninety A.D. is when majority of scholars say the book was written. A small number of scholars say it was written in the sixties. And uh, much fewer scholars say it was written after 90 AD. So why is it given the 70 to 90 date? Is because, like we talked about, uh, Luke uses Mark as a basis for writing. And Mark is usually dated around 64 AD. So Luke would have been written after that. Uh, and also Luke uh, refers to the temple's destruction. Um, almost like it was a past event. Uh, and the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So usually, uh, so one of the readings, uh, one of the scholars I was reading uh, was putting it mostly at early 70s is when the book of Luke is written. Uh, because he also talks about certain riots that happened in Acts. In the book of Acts, he talks about certain riots that happened. And that seems to be a pretty uh, close to when the riots actually happened, that he's writing about it. So based on that, the dating is given. And place of writing, probably Rome. Uh, the key verse from Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So uh, the Son of Man being something that Luke focuses on a lot and uh, on saving the lost, uh, like we saw in all of those parables as well. So comparing this with other books, uh, in Ezekiel, uh, the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is someone who represents Israel. And we see the Son of Man used uh, up to 90 times in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, in Luke, Jesus is that Son of Man. Uh, and he is God's representative. So Ezekiel is the representative of Israel. Um, in Luke, Jesus is God's representative to Israel. Um, compared to the book of Matthew, Matthew talks about Jesus, the Messiah, being rejected, uh, whereas Luke talks about Jesus, the Son of Man, being gladly accepted uh, by the people. The synoptics, uh, Luke uh, used Mark as one of his sources. Uh, but still we see more than half of Luke is not found in any of the other Gospels. So a large part of that journey to Jerusalem that Luke records is not in any of the other Gospels. So he does a lot more detailed uh, study of Jesus's life and ministry uh, than the other Gospels. So Luke uh, also contains a much more complete account of Christ's family background, birth, childhood than the other Gospels. Uh, and we can look at Luke as the first part of a trilogy, so like a three-part writing. Uh, Luke talks about Christ's earthly ministry. Acts talks about Christ's ministry through his church. And Hebrews talks about Christ's high priestly ministry in heaven. Uh, so Hebrews is not written by Luke. He is suggested as one of the authors, but um, may not really be one of the authors of Hebrews. Uh, but just to put into context that um, this the different uh, focuses of each book, where Luke focuses on his earthly ministry and Acts focuses on Christ's ministry through the church, uh, and then Hebrews on Christ's high, high priestly ministry. So uh, with this, we come to the end of the background of Luke. We can go into the actual gospel. Um, 
maybe I can just open up the list of people who we were assigned chapters to. But if you know that uh, your whichever chapter you're doing, you can go ahead and uh, and cover your chapter, please. I'll just post this list on the Google chat. I think we're starting with Abhishek Nlukwan. OK, it's Abhishek, and we are going to look at Luke 1. So uh, if we if you just want the outline, we can uh, divide in the parts. Like uh, from Luke, uh, from verse 1 to 4, it's dedication to Theophilus. I'm not specifically sure that uh, Theophilus is a person or it's uh, referring to an, but the it's a Greek word. And the, uh, the main of uh, Theophilus is loved by God. Uh, second one is uh, from verse 5 to 25, John's birth announced to Zechariah. And uh, from verse 26 to 38, Christ's birth announced to Mary. 39 to 45, Mary, uh, uh, Mary meet to Elizabeth. And 46 to 56, the song of Mary. Uh, 57 and 66, birth of John the Baptist. And 67 to 80, Zechariah's prophecy. So... Uh, we can see this Luke chapter 1 of uh, the fulfillment of two prophecies, which is uh, one of John the Baptist and second one is our Jesus Christ. Uh, the uh, prophecy of uh, John the Baptist's birth is mentioned in Malachi 3.1 and the prophecy of uh, Jesus' birth is uh, mentioned in Isaiah chapter 7.40. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, we can go into Luke chapter 2. Alvis. Okay, I'm not sure if he's here. So uh, I'll just cover Luke 2 and Luke 3 as well. Uh, Andrew's not here. So, um, so in Luke 2, uh, we have uh, the birth of Jesus recorded. Uh, so this happens when the uh, David and uh, when Joseph and uh, Mary have traveled to Bethlehem for the census. Uh, Luke records the census for us. So again, giving us uh, the general historical timeline, uh, the historical background for when uh, Jesus was born. And um, Jesus is born, and then the angels go to uh, the shepherds in the field and announce to them that the Savior is born. Uh, the shepherds then go and find Jesus uh, in the manger, and they rejoice and go and share with others uh, about the Savior who has been born. Uh, after this, we have the recording of Jesus presented in the temple. Uh, now, here we see that uh, there uh, repeatedly Luke uh, talks about how Joseph and Mary were following the Old Testament law. So, uh, the, as per the Old Testament law, as per Jewish law, they dedicate him uh, on the eighth day, and uh, and they also take the sacrifice that is due for every firstborn male, uh, which is a pair of doves or two young pigeons, as per the law. And while he's being presented in the temple, we see Simeon and Anna. Uh, Simeon is someone who had been waiting for the Messiah's coming. And Anna was a prophetess, both of them in the temple who meet uh, the family and prophesy um, about Jesus' ministry. And um, Anna then goes and begins to tell other people about Jesus. Um, so then we see the record of Jesus uh, at 12 years of age uh, when uh, the family travels for the Passover that he stays back in the temple and uh, his parents go back and find him three days later, uh, talking to the people, uh, to the religious leaders, and discussing matters with them. And people are amazed at uh, his knowledge of the scriptures. So in two places in this chapter, we see about how Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in strength. Uh, so a record of Jesus' childhood. 
Um, then in Luke 3, we have an introduction of John's ministry. Um, so uh, again, we have a little bit of a background of who was in power in government and the high priests who were uh, on who were appointed at that time. So again, giving us a very clear historical timeline of when these things were happening. Um, so uh, John went to baptize people, and it has a record of what was John's message. He started to preach about the kingdom, calling people to repentance. Uh, then Jesus goes to him. Uh, Jesus is baptized. Uh, by John, and we see uh, the record of the Holy Spirit coming on Jesus and um, the declaration that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, and then we have a genealogy of Jesus uh, right from Jesus Joseph to Adam. Okay, so this genealogy is very different from Matthew's genealogy. Uh, Matthew is trying to prove uh, Jesus as a descendant of David, Jesus as a descendant of Abraham, uh, because he's writing to Jews. But Luke uh, wants to show that Jesus uh, is in the line of Adam. He's the son of man. But son of Adam, he ends with son of Adam, the son of God. So uh, Jesus is the son of man and the son of God. Uh, that is Luke's genealogy of Jesus. Uh, with that, we can go into Luke 4. Is Angeline here? No. Okay, we'll go into Luke 4. Um, so uh, uh, the Holy Spirit from Jesus' baptism leads him into the wilderness where he's tested. Like we talked about last week, uh, I, I didn't go into this in detail, but Jesus' wilderness testing is uh, can be compared to the Israelites in the wilderness because all the three temptations are directly related to the Israelites in the wilderness. Uh, the provision of food, so man shall not live by bread alone. Uh, do not test the Lord your God uh, is uh, related to the Israelites testing God in the wilderness, questioning how is God going to provide. Uh, when they're thirsty, when they're hungry, uh, they are testing God. They don't trust God, even though God has provided. Uh, and then the third one, worship the Lord your God. So all these are from Deuteronomy. Uh, uh, two of them from Deuteronomy 6, one from Deuteronomy 8. Um, and then we see Jesus rejected in his hometown, Nazareth. So that's up in Galilee. Uh, when we're looking at the map, uh, Jesus goes there and he gives the two examples of, uh, from the Old Testament of uh, people that Elijah ministered to, uh, that Elijah and Elisha ministered to who were non-Israelites. And so he talks about how a uh, prophet is rejected by his own people. Uh, and this is why Elijah and Elisha minister to non-Israelites, because uh, the Israelites themselves were non-receptive to God. Um, then we have a record of Jesus uh, healing a demon-possessed man. Uh, here we see him silencing the spirits who know who he is and want to, uh, want to reveal his identity to people. Uh, and then there's a record of Jesus healing, uh, uh, healing um, people from various sicknesses, laying his hands on them, healing demon-possessed people, uh, and then uh, going to a place where he can pray, uh, so spending time in prayer at the end of that. Uh, so we're at the end of Luke 4. Luke 5 is, sorry, I lost my chat. Yes, Pastor, is it audible? Yeah, you can go ahead. Yes. Okay. I'm reading uh, Luke chapter 5. Um, some, I, I'll just read out the summary of this chapter. The chapter focuses on the mercy of the Lord and his ability to forgive sins on earth. 
and on the calling of his first disciples, Simon, Andrew, John, James, and Levi. So if we look at Luke 5, verse 1 to 3, Jesus teaches the multitudes on the shores of the Lake of Galilee out of Simon's book. Uh, Luke 5, verse 4 to 7, Simon shows blind faith and humble character when the Lord Jesus instructs him to go out in the catch pit. His father, his future disciples have seen Jesus' power and authority when by obedience miraculously they caught a multitude of fish. If you can Luke 5 verse 8 to 11. Simon shows his humble character when he makes a clear distinction between himself as a sinful man and Jesus as the man. And this fisherman are all amazed at the miraculous catch of fish and they all respond immediately to Jesus' call to follow him. And 5 verse 12 to 14, Jesus feels Jesus heals a man full of leprosy. Here we see the humble heart of this poor man. He sees first the will of the Lord in his case. And 15 to 26. The Lord fame spreads and he heals many of their infirmities by showing his mercy towards humans. Jesus heals a man that is sick with paralysis showing the authority on earth of the beloved son of God in human form to forgive sins. So, uh, 5 verse 27 to 32, the oldest of the society, Levi, receives a call to follow Jesus. Levi follows the Lord and happily gives a feast. 5 verse 33 to 39, Jesus is asked Asked a question about fasting, the Lord answered the question and gives the parables of the new garment and the new world. Thank you, sister. Uh, Luke 6. Luke chapter 6. Here we can see Luke chapter 6, uh, verse 1 to 5. Jesus accused of breaking Sabbath day law. And Jesus and his disciple picking and eating head of the grains. Pharisees come and said, Jesus breaking Sabbath day law. In verse 5, Jesus answered that the son of the man is also Lord of the Sabbath. In, it happened again in this same chapter, is verse 6 to 11. Here we see Jesus again healed a man on the Sabbath day. Then Pharisees and scribes come and said, you are working on the day of sabbath so jesus is clearly mentioned again and in verse 6 to uh, verse 12 to 16 jesus went to mountain prayed at all night and jesus selected the tall men as apostles the last we have look at verse 17 to 49 last one here jesus teaches about the characters of the citizens of the kingdom of god Love your enemies, don't return evil for evil, avoid unjust judgments. Good people bears good fruits, bad people bears bad food. And last conclusion, Jesus concluded that teaching about the man building his house with great good foundation and, and the bad foundation. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Luke 7. Is Boniface there? No. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll cover Luke seven. Uh, when Jesus had uh, so we see uh, after Jesus is teaching that there's a centurion whose servant is sick, and he calls he sends uh, some people to call Jesus to heal his. Uh, his servant. So uh, here the centurion uh, talks about uh, Jesus being someone in authority. So he says, you don't need to come to my house. You can just 
uh, say the word from where you are, and I believe that my servant will be healed. And Jesus is astonished by the faith of uh, this is a Gentile, right? Not a Jew. Uh, and he uh, says, I've not seen such faith even in Israel. Um, then uh, Jesus uh, raises from the dead. There's a widow uh, who has lost her only son. and. Uh, Jesus sees the funeral procession as they're exiting the city. And so uh, Jesus has compassion on them. He reaches out and touches uh, the mat on which they're carrying the dead son. And the dead son rises from uh, the dead and um, is able to return to his mother. Uh, we then see John the disciples, uh, John's disciples being sent to Jesus to ask if he is the Messiah that they had been waiting for. John sends them, uh, and Jesus sends them back with the message of what have you seen? You've seen people, the blind heal, the lame walk. Uh, you've seen uh, the poor being ministered to, um, the dead are raised, and so. Um, go back and tell John the Baptist that uh, this is what you're seeing happen. Uh, so uh, John the Baptist is in prison at this time. And so uh, he's in a place of wondering why Jesus has not yet redeemed uh, him or redeemed Israel. So is he the real Messiah? Um, and then Jesus testifies about who John is, uh, as John who is greater than any of the prophets of the Old Testament. But then he says, but anyone who is least in the kingdom of God uh, is greater than John the Baptist. So uh, the kingdom being greater than uh, everything that is declared in the Old Testament, the kingdom of God is uh, greater than that. Um, and then uh, Jesus is invited to a Pharisee's house, and there's a sinful woman who uh, anoints him. Uh, so the Pharisee questions if Jesus is a true prophet because he doesn't know he's allowing the sinful woman to touch him. But Jesus talks about how uh, the love of one who has been forgiven much is greater than the one of uh, the love of uh, someone who is forgiven a little. And he uh, ends with. Uh, telling the woman, your faith has saved you, uh, go in peace. So uh, telling this woman that she is now accepted by him, her sins are forgiven. Um, Luke 8, Charles. Okay, we think he's not here either. Um, so uh, Luke 8, we see the parable of the sower. We covered this in detail in our previous, uh, in um, our other book on interpreting scripture. But um, the word is sown in people's hearts. And based on the status of their heart and how they receive God's word, uh, the fruit, uh, you can see the fruit of that word being sown in people's hearts. Uh, Jesus, Jesus declares that his mother and brothers are those who receive the word and do the word of God, uh, who follow the word of God. Then we see the record of Jesus calming the storm and rebuking uh, the disciples for their lack of faith. Um, we see Jesus going to the land of the Gerasenes and freeing the demon-possessed man, uh, sending uh, the legion of uh, demons that have possessed him into pigs. And uh, those pigs then uh, running down the cliff. So the people there are afraid, and they send Jesus away. But Jesus sends that man who has been uh, who has been freed from the demons back to the, his people to tell them about what God has done for them, uh, done for him. Uh, we then see a story about Jairus, who is a synagogue leader. He calls Jesus to heal his daughter, who is very sick. But on the way. There's a woman with the issue of blood who touches him, who receives healing. Uh, as Jesus is talking to her, Jairus' daughter dies. Uh, but Jesus tells them to have faith. And then he goes and raises her from the dead. 
um, and we end with that uh, where she uh, ra he raises her from the dead and he gives her something to eat and says, don't tell anyone about this. Uh, OK, I think we still have a little more time. Luke 9. Cyril. Uh, Cyril, are you ready to share about Luke 9? Okay, I will. Uh, we'll cover Luke nine, and we'll close with that for today. Um, I'll just do it for us. So Jesus uh, sends the twelve out. He gives them power and authority to drive out all demons, to cure and to cure diseases. He sends them uh, with the instruction to not carry anything with them. So no bags, no money, nothing. Uh, and then he says, when you go into a town, preach to them. If they don't receive you. Uh, shake the dust off your uh, sandals and leave them to uh, receive the judgment that is due to them. Uh, now, uh, now in this chapter, we see the question about who Jesus is arise. So Herod is hearing testimonies about Jesus's ministry and is wondering if John the Baptist has come back to life. Other people think that he is Elijah. Other people think that he is a prophet who was uh, prophesied about in the Old Testament, the prophet that is to come. And so th they think that this is Jesus. Um, uh, then we see the record of Jesus feeding the 5,000. The, this is not given in too much detail in Luke 9, like the other Gospels. Uh, then we see, before this, we see the question of uh, Herod wondering who Jesus is and what other people are saying about Jesus. Now we see Jesus asking the disciples, who do people say I am? And they say the same things that we've read previously in the chapter. And then he says, who do you say I am? And Jesus says, you are God's Messiah. Um, Right after this, Jesus starts to talk about his death. And he says that whoever is his disciple will take up their cross and follow him. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Um, uh, and then whosoever is ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of them when I come in my kingdom. Uh, so Jesus talking about the demands of discipleship. Uh, while he's talking about his own suffering. After this, we see the transfiguration. So uh, again, on the identity of Jesus, right? So we're talking about Jesus being uh, Elijah, who was prophesied about, or the prophet who was supposed to come. And now we see in the transfiguration that Moses and Elijah are there with Jesus. And Jesus is declared as greater uh, because the father's testimony uh, is there about who Jesus is. And so Jesus is uh, declared as one who's greater than the prophets. Um, and then they come down from the mountain after the transfiguration. And uh, there's a boy who is demon possessed. Uh, Jesus healed that boy who the disciples were not able to heal. Uh, again, Jesus predicts his death. Uh, and then we see some opposition. Uh, that's coming in from the Samaritans. They don't want Jesus to go through their uh, villages because he's on his way to Jerusalem. So the disciples, um, the disciples want to call down fire on the Samaritans like Elijah did. Uh, but Jesus says, we're not going to do that. Uh, then Jesus talks about the cost of following him. And uh, he, he calls people to follow him. And he talks about the fact that you should be willing to follow me no matter what. So you don't turn your, uh, once you put your hand to the plow, you don't turn back. Uh, and then uh, one person who gives the excuse of burying his father, Jesus, let the dead bury their own dead. Uh, so with that, we come to the end of chapter 9. We'll continue from chapter 10 on Thursday. So if you've been assigned uh, one of these chapters, please be ready to share um, on Thursday. 
if you're not going to be there on Thursday and you know in advance, please uh, post on Google Classroom so we can be prepared. Thank you all for being here. See you on Thursday.